Welcome. Uh, welcome to this incredibly uh, important webinar hosted by Vicente Cedarberg uh, on OSHA compliance in the cannabis industry. My name is Mark Ross. I am the head of impact in ESG, environmental, social, and, go and governance for the law firm. I also participate in the law firm's environmental health and safety practice. I've been an environmental attorney for 30 years, uh, public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector. Uh, most pertinent to this discussion is I was in-house counsel at Alcoa, the massive aluminum conglomerate where I was in an environmental health and safety attorney there inside the company in the late 90s and early aughts and dealt with a whole wide variety of environmental health and safety issues. I am so thrilled that we have such an amazing panel today of experts in this field. Um, I'd first like to introduce each one of them and have them tell you a little bit about themselves, starting with uh, one of my favorite colleagues, uh, Casey Lever. So Casey, please uh, tell the fine folks about yourself and what you do here at Vicente Cedarberg. Thanks, Mark. I'm the Director of Regulatory Compliance for Vicente Cedarberg. Uh, my job primarily is helping our clients, you know, become operational, work through the inspection process with, you know, cannabis regulators, any other state and local regulators that may apply, as well as, you know, once you're operational, staying that way, um, staying out of trouble, conducting compliance audits, and really, you know, helping our clients navigate everything the cannabis businesses have to offer, lots of fire drills, both figuratively and literally. Um, so trying to help prevent them and put them out. Thanks, Casey. Today, we also have uh, Kelsey Hanley from Allay Consulting. Kelsey, please uh, take it away. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. So I work with LA Consulting. We are a regulatory compliance consulting company for the cannabis industry. We support our clients from seed to sale uh, to make sure that they are in compliance with unique state requirements and federal requirements such as FDA, USDA, and OSHA. Uh, we also support the industry with gaining various certifications that include GMP, GACP, and organic. Uh, but personally, I have worked with OSHA regulations for about 11 years uh, in different types of industries uh, that include aluminum manufacturing, uh, same as Mark, I used to work with Alcoa, um, and then I worked in oil and gas and now cannabis. So I'm excited to be here today and chat OSHA uh, in the cannabis industry. Thanks, Kelsey. And uh, last but not least, we have Alex Herding. Uh, who's with the National Cannabis Risk Prevention Services. Alex, can you please tell the folks about yourself and your company? Yes, well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Obviously, a really important conversation. Yes, at the NCRPS, we, um, we help cannabis businesses, insurers, and banks manage risk. Um, we look at all different types of risk, including product safety and worker safety. Um, I have a background um, in science, uh, water, soil, actually a lot of occupational safety and health work before I got into cannabis, uh, and I have designed, built, and operated multiple cannabis businesses myself. Um, found out there wasn't a lot of standards, um, really started with the, with the worker safety side of it all, and, um, and has, have built out a larger risk control matrix. Um, that we can assess the any canvas business in the in the vertical with. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Well, thanks, Alex. Uh, again, I'm thrilled to have these fine folks joining us today to uh, tell you all about the risks um, that OSHA presents and how we can try to avoid them and what to do if there's an issue. So, here's the agenda for today: uh, What is OSHA? Its history and its high-level basic requirements. How does OSHA most commonly apply to cannabis operations? Um, what are the most common OSHA violations by cannabis operators? What can operators do to ensure that they are OSHA compliant? And what should an operator do should they find that they have OSHA violations? All right. So basically, uh, let's talk about OSHA's background. Uh, OSHA was established, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration uh, was created in 1970 as part of the Occupational uh, Safety and Health Administration to ensure the safe and healthy work conditions for workers by setting enforceable standards. This applies to most private sector employees and their workers. Uh, there is delegated authority from the federal government to 22 states that have their own OSHA 
uh, programs, very similar to other environmental laws where there is delegation, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, et cetera. Uh, compliance officers carry out inspections and assess fines for regulatory violations. And inspections occur without notice, uh, often triggered by workplace fatalities, multiple mm -hmm. hospitalizations, worker complaints, or referrals. So that's the basics about how OSHA came about. Um, in terms of OSHA itself, uh, employers must inform workers about chemical hazards through training, labels, alarms, color-coded systems, chemical information sheets, and other methods. Uh, employers must provide safety training to workers in a language and vocabulary that they can understand. Uh, keep accurate records of work-related injuries and illnesses. Perform tests in the workplace, such as air sampling required by uh, and some OSHA Act st uh, standards. Uh, provide required protective uh, personal protective equipment at no cost to workers. Provide hearing exams and other medical tests when required by OSHA standards. Uh, post OSHA citations and annually post OSHA. Uh, post-injury illness summary data uh, where workers can see them. Uh, notify OSHA within eight hours of workplace fatality. Notify OSHA within 24 hours of all work-related uh, inpatient hospitalizations. Prominent employers must prominently display the official OSHA job safety and health uh, requirements. It's the law poster uh, that describes rights and responsibilities under OSHA. And uh, employers must not retaliate or discriminate against workers for using their rights under the law, including their, right, including their right to report work-related injuries or illnesses. So um, can't be punished for whistleblowers. Let's talk briefly about uh, some of the most cited violations. This is just generally, we're going to get into cannabis in a little bit, but the most cited violations under OSHA, fall protection. You have to protect employees working on surfaces uh, with an unprotected side and edge above six feet in height. Chemical hazard communications, I think self-explanatory. Scaffolding, mainly construction workers at heights 10 feet and above. Lockout, tag out. Um, you have to um, discharge of energy when servicing or maintaining machines or equipment. Uh, respiratory protection, respirator use and fit, training, maintenance, and repair. Ladders is another most cited violation. Uh, powered industrial trucks, so forklifts, motorized hand trucks, uh, and that includes training on how to use them in a safe manner. Uh, have fall protection. There has to be training requirements. There's training requirements to prevent uh, falls within a workplace. Machine guarding, so guarding for machinery. Any, any machinery that cuts, there needs to be machine guarding. Uh, and then personal protective and life-saving equipment, mostly uh, eye and face protection equipment needs to be on site. And if you don't have it, be prepared to be cited. So that those are the basics around OSHA, where it came from, what's required of employers and the most cited violations. Now we'd like to move a little bit more into cannabis. And let me go back. Is that we are not ready for that screen yet. Um, so, let me just start with um, what does OSHA most commonly, what, what, um, where does OSHA most commonly apply to cannabis operations? And let me just start with Kelsey uh, to explain where that, where we most often see OSHA and cannabis intersecting. Yeah, yeah. So contrary to popular belief, OSHA regulations are applicable to the entire cannabis industry, seed to sale. So wherever you have employees, OSHA will ensure employers are providing a safe workplace. So expect to see health and safety oversight over all aspects of the cannabis industry. So this includes cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, lab testing, retail, et cetera. Um, but although OSHA has the regulatory oversight in all aspects of the cannabis businesses, we commonly see most OSHA site visits and violations at cultivations, manufacturing, and the lab testing facilities. Um, these facility types have the most exposure 
and potential for injury or illness at the workplace, which is why we see more OSHA visits at these types of workplaces. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, Casey, anything to add there? Yeah, I mean, in my experience too, you know, as, as Kelsey mentioned, any business where you have employees, OSHA applies. Um, there are even, you know, certain state regulations like New Jersey that requires on-site consultation agreement with the um, New Jersey, you know, OSHA group there, where they actually have to come in, do an inspection, make recommendations, and the business has to comply with those recommendations prior to the CRC allowing licensure. So you see a variety of, you know, yes, of course, OSHA applies, but then there's also state specific re cannabis regulations that have really pulled those in. Massachusetts, for example, says you have to comply with OSHA standards, but doesn't go as far as to say, you need to bring in this group and go through a consultation. Um, I would say, you know, when, if you're a cannabis operator and you're thinking about, you know, OSHA generally, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is, you know, the hazardous communication and hazardous material storage. Um, people really, you know, you really got to think about storing things properly and then the impact on the day to day operations. You know, maybe you've stored a hazardous material properly, but someone goes in to service something in the room and has a walkie talkie that is a spark risk and leaves it on top of a container. You know, a lot of those day to day being very diligent. And training your staff is so important. Um, so I see that as such a huge piece of this. And even, you know, as far as retail, although there are other, you know, facets like cultivation, manufacturing in the lab where you see, you know, more hazards potentially, um, even in, you know, dispensaries, I see, you know, cannabis products in boxes stacked all the way to the ceiling um, where, you know, I see somebody going up to reach it and think, well, this, this is a huge risk here. You've got to put those safeguards in place to make sure things aren't falling and things aren't stacked too high, not just from, you know, the cannabis compliance standpoint of being able to see the products on camera, but the fact that somebody's got to climb up there and get it is a huge issue. That's a good point, Casey, especially with regard to retail. People don't usually think of retail as being a, a hazardous work environment, but there may be a loading dock out back that's above six feet where there may not be fall protection or, um, you know, issues like that, or using a ladder, like you said, with boxes stacked to the ceiling. Um, so definitely retail still presents an OSHA hazard. Um, Alex, anything else on clean, your cleanup on this, on this question, anything else that um, you see how OSHA no. applies to the cannabis industry? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I'm very well said. Uh, and the, uh, the, so the, the cannabis industry actually falls in general industry. For, for OSHA and it's lumped in with, you know, most other industries, you know, the it's, it's actually seen as OSHA is not extremely uh, hazardous, but it's, you know, moderate to low and, and what there's a lot of education going on, both from the industry side and OSHA side. OSHA is still trying to figure out what are the most severe hazards. Um, and, and the industry for really needs a lot of education. One, to know that OSHA is actually OSHA standards actually apply, um, but what are those standards and how how to how to use them um, uh, successfully to to prevent any type of injury? And I, I just want to note too, you know, OSHA in a lot of ways is you know they they respond to incidents and 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 most of the time you see OSHA is because something has happened, um, and and a lot of the times in this industry is because because uh, an employee has called. So, you know, there's there's a lot of learning to do right now. Cannabis businesses can do better. Um, you know, OSHA for the, for really I've seen as being very helpful. You know, they they tend to not want to come in and and wield, you know, their violations. Um, so, I think it's just it's a time to 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 really, you know, reach across the aisle and and to to work with OSHA and and for OSHA to work with the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think we all agree we want to have safe workplaces for our employees. Cannabis industry does not need to develop a reputation of having unsafe workplaces. So um, it serves everybody well to be together in that goal with OSHA. Um, just uh, before we move to the next question, uh, we are going to be taking um, questions at the end of this session. Please use the Q&A function as opposed to the regular chat function. Chat can tend to get um, a little bit um, crowded uh, and questions can get lost in there. So please use the Q&A function and we'll get to you uh, at the end of the webinar. 
Next question. Um, so we've talked generally about how OSHA can apply to the cannabis industry. Let's talk about what some of the most common uh, OSHA violations we see in the cannabis industry. Uh, and why don't we kick off this one with, with, uh, with Casey, please. Sure. Um, so some of the common violations that you know, we see are, again, like I'd mentioned, the hazardous communication, hazardous material storage. There's a lot of compressed gas, a lot of flammable liquid that needs to be stored properly in facilities, manufacturing, cultivation, labs. I would say, in my experience, I see the most of the labs just because of the tight quarters sometimes you're in and storing certain chemicals in a manner that doesn't allow, you know, vapor release or how much, you know, of a particular product can be stored in a certain cabinet. Does the cabinet need to be separate? Really understanding what your risks are and how to properly store them. And that's one thing, you know, what I see in cannabis is, you know, maybe from the beginning during licensure, during the initial fire walkthrough, everything is set up perfectly, but that ongoing compliance and that training is so crucial to that. Even, you know, exterior signage and signage on cabinets, you know, do not store these things here, store this here, just reiterating and, you know, really making sure your staff understand is so important because in cannabis it's moving, right? But unfortunately it's sometimes moving so fast that you forget about what's really important and that's safety. So the hazardous material storage has become so huge and, you know, with the hazardous materials, secondary containers in cultivation and manufacturing, we see a lot of spray bottles in places. I can't tell you how many times I've picked up a spray bottle and wondered what's in this. I shouldn't have to wonder, you know, if I get that in my eye, I need to know what's in here. And this, you know, can it, you know, should it be stored in the cultivation room? Where does it get put back? If I don't know what's in it, I can't properly handle it. I can't properly store it. And those are the things that, you know, as cannabis operators, you know, we're really focused on the business, right? Growing cannabis compliantly, safe cannabis for the consumers and patients. But that part is so important that you remember how you got there and how to safely get it into the consumer's hands. So I see that as a huge violation, secondary containers and labeling. Um, and then uh, again, with handling hazardous materials, SDS sheets, um, maintaining them. That's great. You had your initial product order, you have all the SDS for those, you've done hazardous communication for those, but you know, you open the cabinet again and I've got new products or something new shows up. Did you do, do you have the SDS for that? Was there training on that? Do I have the proper PPE for handling that? All of those things need to have constant attention. Um, so I see that as a, another big violation. And I recently mentioned PPE, but that means respirators. Um, there are a lot of production of tablets I see on the market right now. Um, and that requires, that's a lot of dust kicks up and a lot of material comes in the air for that. So making sure you have respirators, are they fit properly? Know who's going to be using them. You know, new staff come in and out. There is a lot of turnover. Everybody needs training. Everybody needs proper PPE. Um, another violation I see, and I won't take them all because I know Kelsey's like, I, I've got a whole bunch too. Um, the eyewash stations and replacing that liquid in an eyewash station. That's a huge one. Um, and you know, keeping up with the fire safety requirements. I do see a lot of fire extinguishers blocked by the door, you know, door stops. People put a door stop and not realize there's a fire extinguisher right behind that. People, I've seen people use fire extinguishers as a door stop. Um, definitely not good. Um, so that's a very common one that I see. Um, those are just, you know, some of the ones that, again, on a day-to-day, -day, no matter what the facility is, I've seen things like that as OSHA violations. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the hazardous chemical one, Casey, because that also moves into the realm of RECRA, um, uh, the Resource Conservation and Reclamation Act. So not only could you have an issue with OSHA violations, but you could have RECRA violations. And RECRA violations are significant uh, in terms of fines and potential for jail time. So um, you get a double whammy there if you're not doing the right thing with your hazardous chemicals. Kelsey, what have you seen in terms of common violations in the cannabis space? Yeah, so Casey, very well said. I'm basically going to be piggybacking <laughs> off of exactly what you just said. Um, so back to the hazardous communication, you are communicating all the hazards in your facility you're required to. So a, a big piece of that is labeling. And to your point of seeing a clear liquid in a spray bottle, you don't know what it is. Is it water? Is it ISO? What, what could it be? And so that, that communication isn't just beneficial for employees at that workplace. It's beneficial for visitors, for regulators who come in, 
the fire department, like the fire department wants to know what you guys have in there. So properly labeling everything is, is super important and you're required to. Um, uh, other most common violations that, that I see stemming from an OSHA visit um, are a lot around the flammable liquids, explosive gases. So back to the unsafe handling practices, um, they're going to look into how you're using it properly. Are you storing it properly? Mm. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of those components uh, not only have to deal with, you know, PPE usage when handling those types of materials and stuff, but are there other methods that you can use outside of PPE that would, that would be a better fit? Like ventilation is, is a, big deal when dealing with, you know, hazardous chemicals, um, especially in C1D1 and C1D2 rooms. Um, there's a lot of focus on that ventilation. Um, and then, yeah, PPE, like, are you using the right PPE for the task? That's a big one. Does it fit properly? Uh, is it available for use? Is it clean? Is it new? You know, is it stored properly? Um, and yeah, I guess, Casey, going back to your point about the respiratory protection violations, that is very common. Um, typically, if you are requiring your staff to use a respirator, that comes with other programs that you have to have. So you have to have a respiratory protection program in place, uh, medical evaluations for each of your employees, a fit testing. You know, these are all supporting evidence that you will then provide the OSHA investigator to say, hey, we've done everything that we need to here. So, you know, we're, we're not in violation here. So you're basically just setting yourself up for success with all of the supporting documentation. Thanks, Kelsey. And, and Alex, uh, what have you seen in the, in the cannabis industry as some of the more common OSHA violations, including, I know there've been some high profile cases recently. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the couple general violations and a couple, yeah, specific ones. So, you know, um, yeah, definitely a lot of hazard communication um, issues. You know, not training employees is is a big one on the different um, hazard hazardous chemicals. Um, you know, not reporting injury. So, any uh, employee that needs medical attention outside just first aid attention on site, you know, that you need to report that. There's OSHA forms 300, 301 that are not reported um, correctly. Um, a lot of times, um, like you mentioned with RICRA, there's universal uh, waste laws. So, every light bulb essentially in your facility, uh, the fluorescence, the, you know, the HPS is the, um, um, the halide lights, they all have mercury in them. They all have to be, you know, they all have to be disposed of properly. Um, and it's not too complicated to do that. that you just have to store those, you know, in a proper area, label them what they are, and you have to dispose of them every year. Um, in the proper uh, facility, but a lot of there's there's a lot of violations there. But a, two couple interesting violations um, in Massachusetts. One extremely severe. Um, um, uh, a woman. So cannabis. A lot of times, people aren't aware that people can have allergic reactions and 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 can be sensitive to cannabis itself. Um, and there was an instant um, just recently where. Um, a woman, she was grinding, I think grinding for, for joints or working with teeth and she, I, she wasn't able to breathe and I, she, she died and that was a very serious um, violation. Another less serious violation um, that happened up there was they, they, um, and they found, they, they cited a, a facility for not having a safety data sheet for cannabis, which in my opinion, was uh, it's a little early to do that because there really hasn't been an, a standard safety data sheet for cannabis yet. Um, and they cited them, and it was for, I believe, on the grounds of uh, it, it, Keith being an explosive dust, which I personally believe the allergen and sensitivity is more serious than the explosive dust side of it all because you know these explosive dusts and sawmills are a very serious situation, but if sawdust was as valuable as Keef, they would, I would wager to bet it would never, you would never have an explosive um, dust situation in the sawmill. Um, but that being said, NIST, um, the National Institute of Science and Technology is actually studying the sensitivity and allergic reactions to cannabis. And I believe that will likely lead to the first 
safety data sheet for, um, for cannabis. Thanks, Alex. And then just to add, I know that there have been certain, out of the West Coast, there have been uh, OSHA whistleblower uh, allegations, um, some from the illicit market operators, but also from, from legal market operators that have led to investigations from OSHA and fines being assessed. So uh, it's not just uh, self-reporting, it's not just uh, OSHA inspectors coming in, but also your employees, uh, as I think was referred to earlier, are often the, the, um, the initiators of these investigations. Um, and they can be quite serious. The other thing I guess to note is we're not just talking about fines here. We are talking about injuries of employees and potential for death. Um, incredibly serious. Um, no company wants that on their books or in their in the newspapers for sure, um, or frankly part of their karma. So, anyway, moving on. Um, let's 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 figure out how we can help folks stay in compliance with OSHA. With OSHA. Uh, let's start with Alex. What can operators do to ensure that they are OSHA compliant? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And really, to be OSHA compliant, you, you have to hire a professional who actually understands OSHA and the standards. So, you know, for large corpor corporations or companies, you know, really, it's like above 50 employees, you really should have uh, a safety manager officer that is, you know, their, their dedicated job is to occupational safety and health. For smaller companies, I believe OSHA compliance falls under the, the compliance manager or, or officer's role. Um, and, you know, outside the personnel, you really need a safety program and you need to identify the hazards in your facility. And you really, in, in almost every case, you really just need to hire a safety professional to do a hazard assessment and to build up all the required OSHA plans that, you know, a, that a business needs. And, you know, we mentioned, you know, a bunch of them, but, you know, I can't, every business is going to need a hazard communication plan. You're going to need emergency action plan, potentially a respiratory protection plan. If you have any type of uh, respirators and those are even N95s. And so you, you, you really need that as a, you know, a written plan, like we mentioned the lockout tagout energy control, fire protection plan. If you're in a rural, rural area outside of emergency um, services, you're also gonna need a, a first aid plan. Um, and even in some facilities that have noise issues, they could potentially need a, um, a hearing conservation plan. So, you know, you can't do this without a professional. Um, you know, you can obviously run an operation and have, you know, have, have a safety professional, you know, um, you know, work inside your company and, and, and to, to execute these plans, but without the plans in place and without an initial um, hazard assessment of your facility, you're really going blind. And so that's, that, that's what the first step in the being compliant. Thanks, Alex. Kelsey, what can you add to that about how what companies can do to make sure that they are OSHA compliant? Yeah, absolutely. So, Alex, great job covering, you know, the benefit of getting a professional in there and really assessing, you know, what the actual workplace hazards are, and then they can go from there. Um, something else that, that I think is very beneficial that it, I don't think gets the attention it needs is making safety a part of the workplace culture. So, making sure that safety is a part of like your daily talks and then becomes your daily expectations, right? So encouraging your staff members to bring up, you know, any safety concerns they may have. Um, it's very important as employers to validate their concerns. Uh, that encourages, you know, that relationship there of, you know, knowing that, hey, my employer like really su supports me here. Um, Something that I have found to kind of like create that culture is having different departments visit each other so that, uh, and, and they can conduct like a safety evaluation to like for the day. Um, this kind of takes away from people within the department like pointing, uh, pointing fingers at each other, right? So it, it comes, it comes um, at it from a different point of view and they may see something that, you know, the people who work in the department haven't seen just because they work in that department all the time. So I, I think culture is a huge part of um, making sure that a facility, you know, actually stays OSHA compliant. Kelsey, thanks for mentioning the safety committee uh, idea. Someone actually in the Q&A has asked 
uh, about speaking to the importance of having a safety committee and, and incident yeah. investigations. Do you just want to elaborate quickly on incident investigations once the safety committee identifies some issues? Uh, yeah. So actually, when I worked at the oil refinery, um, grown men mm. love stickers. And so every time a safety issue was brought up to the safety staff, they would get a sticker and then we would talk about it in the committee. So bringing people together from different departments, talking about the importance and of the issue and fixing it while also including staff is, is incredibly important um, during that committee and really creating that relationship, a positive relationship with staff uh, and safety. In case anything else you can add with regard to how a company can ensure um, that they are OSHA compliant. Yeah, I think, you know, I think they really hit it all. But one of the important things that I, you know, keep saying is, you know, routine maintenance and training, you know, really staying diligent about these things, you know, working it into your monthly, you know, inventory audits like you would anything else that you do an audit of your SDS sheets, that you're auditing which products are on site, that, you know, there's continuous training, that there are safeguards and you know policies in place where if something new is on site any product any anything from you know something you use for cleaning to a new you know environmental media that there is someone who knows about it and takes a good look at what you're bringing on and what training and ppe may be necessary to properly bring that on site and if you don't have that you know in place one day you know months later you're going to find out that nobody knows how to properly handle something and it may be too late yeah and i'll just add every time i was ever on site whether when i was working for pennsylvania dep or alcoa every single meeting every single site visit started with a safety talk um, these are the hazards that you could encounter this is the ppe you need to wear um you know just these are the emergency exits uh it was always safety was always 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 first um and uh you know i can't stress that enough i don't see enough of that in cannabis operations that i've been through although i've seen an increasing amount of of attention to osha um and safety hazards um, but that's a good way to start every single discussion and kelsey i think you just had your finger up to add yeah, yeah, that reminds me a lot of uh, back to our Alcoa days are the toolbox talks. And we would have a toolbox talk at the, at the beginning of every day and also during um, special tasks. So like, so there, there's a study that was done and I can't remember the name of the study. However, it covered um, when people are most likely to get hurt on the job. And so the top two were uh, tasks not performed often. So it's very important to have that toolbox talk to review the task, review the safety potential issues and like what the employer is doing to make sure that their staff is safe. And then another common way people get hurt is if they're, um, if they're completing a task that they do all the time. They're used to it. Oh, I don't need to do the safety stuff. I've done this for five years, blah, blah, blah that is a, a safety trap that, that we all need to be aware of and, and just talk about it. Yeah, and one of those uh, tasks that's not an everyday task, I imagine would be harvest day and uh, room flipping day um, as plants are being taken out of a room and, the, and the, the room is being cleaned for bringing new plants in. That doesn't happen every day. That happens, you know, weeks and weeks out. Um, that could be mm -hmm. a good day to do. And you're using chemicals at that point to clean the room. Uh, and you're using maybe sharp objects to cut the plants out. Um, those would be good days to have those particular toolbox talks. Um, last question um, that I have before we get to the Q&A, and again, please put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. The chat's getting a little crowded with some discussion, which is good, we, we encourage that, uh, but we wanna see your important questions. Um, what should an operator do if they, if they find that they have an OSHA violation? an employee brings one to them or um, it's just discovered somehow through an inspection or through a consultant uh, that there's a violation. Let's start with Kelsey on this one. What, what, what should an operator do? Yeah, so operators should report all violations to the employer. So uh, my best piece of advice is present facts you know, to your employer. This is what's going on. Um, they need to be made aware. Maybe they might not know. So like anything that, that 
staff may see as a violation, you know, you need to talk about that with your employer. Um, as a reminder, employers are required to provide a safe workplace, so they will need to correct the workplace hazard. Um, but if they don't fix the issue, that's where things get tricky. So, um, so you can bring in a professional, like what Alex was saying, to support the company in identifying and fixing workplace hazards. Um, not only will a professional be able to fix the violation, but they will most likely be able to identify other violations and fix them and help create the required plans and conduct required trainings. Um, however, if the employer doesn't fix the violation or a professional isn't hired to support the company, um, a complaint to OSHA can be made. And so Mark has touched on this several times, but OSHA does protect whistleblowers. So your employer cannot legally retaliate. <clears throat> so there, there are some, some ways that you can do um, if there are violations observed and, and what employees can do. <clears throat> Casey, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, and you know, no, no violation is too small. You know, there are general hazards around any facility. The one that comes to my mind is, you know, most cannabis regulations require, you know, a, like a registration card, right, that you have to visibly display. And I see that a lot on lanyards. I've actually been in a facility where somebody leaned over a machine with a lanyard and sucked it right off their neck, which, you know, luckily it was a lanyard that was fragile enough that the card just broke off. But I'm sure, you know, at the time, you know, the, the agent was just like, oh, no, now I don't have my, my card visible. I need to go get a temporary one or else I can't work. It wasn't like, oh, that's a hazard. We should probably make sure people aren't leaning over the trimmer at this time. So it was one of those opportunities where to point out, listen, this, this is an OSHA violation. Tell you, you know, you have to talk to your employer about making sure there are certain safety procedures in place. Um, a big one that I see too is, the, the carbon filters, they have fans on the top a lot. And if you can reach your hand over the fan, there should be a gate or something to stop that, some sort of a mesh or net that would prevent somebody from putting their hand in. It's small, but there is no hazard too small in a facility. It, it should absolutely be reported to your employer if you see something or you know experience something, God forbid. Yeah, and we already know that employers are required to report um, uh, injuries, at least injuries that require hospitalizations and fatalities to OSHA. At what point should an uh, operator call up OSHA and say, we, we have a problem here besides fatalities and injuries? Should they, or should they just work on fixing them and not say anything to OSHA? Oh, Kelsey or Alex want to take that? <laughs> you know, and I, I think it all starts, there's a couple, I think it, you got to take a step back. And again, one, you have to have somebody who understands OSHA and the violations. And so, you know, you, you really need a complete safety program and understand what those safety plans um, in them are, you know, what they're mitigating, what they're, what violations they are preventing. And so, so really it starts with education. And then it talks, you know, we talked a little bit here about culture, right? There needs to be a fear, a lack of fear for, for reporting these things. So there really should be a policy, um, you know, non-reprisal policy, even though it's the law, you know, employees should be really feel comfortable with reporting, you know, something, something off. And then it comes down to the severity of the issue, right? If it's just, you know, if there's just a, you know, a plug, you know, or cord you know, sitting in a puddle, well, you know, that can potentially be pretty, you know, corrected pretty easily. You know, some of these hazards can just be fixed. Um, if it's something that is not fixable and, and there's really a lack of understanding what to do, then again, OSHA is very open to helping. They really don't want to give these violations. And if you do reach out to them, they, for the most part, are very willing to work with the company and organization to help correct those issues. So, you know, it's really about doing, doing your due diligence. I mean, the worst thing that could happen is a company sees a hazard and then does nothing with it. Um, that is where the willful violation comes in and it becomes extremely serious. Thanks, Alex. And there are some states too, you know, we talked about bringing in professional consultants. There are some states where you can actually reach out to the, the state agency and bring them in for a voluntary consultation and they will come in and do a full assessment, help you put together plans and get these fixed. So, you know, you, you don't want to operate scared, especially when you're working with an agency that's about safety. Yeah, and yeah, to bounce off that, Casey, uh, OSHA is 
very willing to work with small businesses too. And they offer that free consulting um, support there too. Great. Well, this has been wonderful. Let's start to dig into some of the Q and A. Um, let me just take the first one and see. Do you think OSHA will create a cannabis category uh, as federal laws change, or do you think it will just stay general? I assume the use of pesticides, chemicals, et cetera, will eventually change. I got good insight into this one here. Um, so I, I strongly, I have a strong indication it'll stay general industry. I've actually worked with the director of OSHA here in, in, um, in Colorado and help them develop the first general industry um, 10 hour course for cannabis. So they are actually designing specific things under the general industry. Um, I don't believe it'll be its own category for pesticides. This is actually really important to understand too. There's another federal standard worker protection standard that is an EPA standard for all employees that work around um, pesticides, agricultural workers and pesticide handlers um, because of the weird uh, uh, federal situation we're in, um, most state agriculture departments will enforce that. So on top of all the OSHA standards, you do have to adhere to the worker protection standard, which is a lot of training um, and, and additional things that you need to have in place um, if you're operating with pesticides. And of course, related to that is the is FIFRA, the Fungicide, Insecticide, and Rodenticide Act, which is a separate environmental law, separate from and apart from OSHA. Yep. Um, do you know of anyone or company who is training specifically cannabis companies about OSHA responsibilities? If I can self-plug, then yes, yes. We're at the NCRPS and we have uh, NCRMA, which is our association and academy that educates. We have a, a track um, of eight or nine occupational safety and health courses. So we go, there's a lot, actually one of the things we didn't touch on here is ergonomic hazards. Um, the trimming and pruning is real serious. OSHA doesn't have a federal ergonomic standard. Um, California is the only state that actually does. Um, but that this, there's still the standards that are, you know, that are in place of, you know, keeping a safe workplace and doing your due diligence. Um, but, but we focus on all the different types of hazards um, and can help your business um, in person as well. So we can, you can take it online or you can have us come in and train um, your facility in person. Uh, OSHA also has a bunch of videos, I was going to say, on their website uh, for the particular hazards um, that you can utilize as training materials in your workplace. Uh, I'm sorry, one of you was going to say something. Yeah, I, I believe um, universities in most states offer, um, I know consulting help, you know, for, for free, of course, uh, depending on the size of the, the business, but I do believe a portion of that is training as well. And like I mentioned, OSHA has developed a, the first 10 hour um, general industry for cannabis. Um, and that I believe it, it was first offered through Red Rocks Community College in Colorado. I don't know if it has expanded past there, but um, that is an, another option. Hi, I am almost at final license. How would a cannabis delivery schedule an appointment for recommendations? What is it? What is normal to look out for in a cannabis uh, delivery warehouse? So let's talk about OSHA and delivery warehouses. Uh, what are some of the um, OSHA issues that could result from that kind of operation that folks should be looking out for? Yeah, so uh, slips, trips, falls. That's going to be common in really any facility, um, but especially warehouse because you're, you're storing a bunch of different, you know, material and boxes and making sure that they're not stacked up too high, like what Casey had mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, lots of slips, trips, falls, um, adequate storage too. Where, where are we storing certain items? Uh, if they're hazardous, we need to store them properly. Um, and then I would say ergonomics to play a lot with, you know, moving material, are you moving it properly? Are you using powered industrial trucks, which then, uh, has a slew of, you know, hazards associated with, with those. Um, so I, I would say those are probably the top ones I'm thinking about right now. 
yeah, work on top of that, working at heights, you know, um, yeah. I would say separation of pedestrian and um, uh, machine traffic, if you will, especially if you have delivery trucks coming in and out, you want to make sure there's adequate separation between pedestrians and, and those vehicles and forklifts and whatever else you may be operating from a machinery standpoint. Um, in light of so many potential OSHA issues and lack of discipline, attention, and compliance, how actually protective is a site's workplace protection insurance? Anyone have any knowledge about insurance issues and how that would apply to health and safety? You know, I, I, insurance right now is trying to figure this out. You know, um, for the most part, you know, insurance, they, they lack the, the actuarial data right now, you know, so there's, they're, they're, the policies, they're still trying to figure out what claims, um, you know, are, are the most, are the most serious. Um, I think they understand, um, especially, you know, if there's, there's a lot coming to light, especially with these ergonomic hazards, um, a lot of strains that are coming in um, claim wise, but I will tell you, you know, one of the biggest concerns I have for, for cannabis is, is the insurance capacity. Um, for right now, insurance, you know, they're doing good for the most part because there's actually a lack of claims right now. I think that's a lot, that has a lot to do with education, lack of understanding of rights. Um, you know, obviously we're focusing on um, worker comp and worker safety, um, um, but What's going to happen, I think, over time is there's going to be an increase of claims, and that's going to increase premiums. And and honestly, it could scare off some employer, uh, some insurers, um, be, because they've made so much money so far. Um, you know, as soon as they are start paying off the claims, they they might see they might see the business in a different light. So there is a lot of I think one of the biggest things that could hold up the industry is just a lack of capacity, lack of um, insurance out there for these operations. And, and really the best way to do that is, is through, is through risk management is through risk mitigation. Um, and then having, you know, best practices in place and everything we talked about here. So there, the insurance is, is, is looming. I think it's one of the big issues that this industry isn't, is, is not seeing coming. Um, and it has a lot to do with the, the federal illegality because the bigger insurance um, they're not here yet. So we're dealing with the smaller businesses and that's going to come with its own issues. Seems to be a lot of big issues that are looming right now for this industry. I always talk about environmental health and safety. Uh, we're talking about health and safety today, but let's not discount the environmental issues that are out there waiting for this industry. Um, I, I want to get to this hierarchy of controls, Alex, which I know you brought to us. But before we do that, let me answer this question. What good quality professional companies can you recommend for building out an OSHA workplace plan, making hazard assessments, and otherwise helping operators uh, to stay within OSHA compliance? Well, these three experts here, um, Casey with Vicente Cedarberg and Kelsey with Allay, uh, and Alex with uh, the National Cannabis Risk Prevention Services, all three of these uh, fine folks can help you in that regard. Uh, Alex, you wanted to make a point, I think, about PPE being really the low-hanging fruit and really the smallest risk in terms of OSHA. Yes. And, and this this hierarchy of controls really demonstrates that. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people have a, a misnomer about PPE. I think there's a lot of um, extra confidence that people have when they wear PPE. It's like wearing like a a helmet while you're skiing or snowboarding. It's like, well, I'm protected now. I can just chuck off this cliff, right? But the way to really, I think, to see hazard, this is a really important way to see hazards, right? Because just putting on gloves or goggles or you know some protective wear isn't going to prevent you from getting hurt. It's actually the least effective way to prevent um, getting injured. And, and really the first thing you have to do is you have to see, can I, can I just remove this hazard, right? Like, is, is there a puddle near the, the, you know, these plugs, can I just remove, you know, take out the plug or remove the puddle? You know, can I just remove the hazard, the tripping hazard that's right there? That's the obvious first thing that should happen. Substitution, if there's a chemical that's hazardous, um, um, and you can substitute for something less hazardous or, you know, these chipping machines, sometimes they're run on gas. 
Well, that produces carbon monoxide. Can you use an electric one? So you want to use the least hazardous um, thing, uh, so you can you know substitute from the the more hazardous one. And then if you can't eliminate or substitute, you want to engineer in the solution, right? Or sometimes there's a guard on a on a machine. Um, or, or a wall between something loud, you know, that to, to minimize the hearing, um, you know, hazards. And then, you know, then it's administrative control. So these are work practices. This is, you wanna build out your standard operating procedure. So, so to know how to operate around that hazard. Once you, you know, eliminated the substitute and built a, a barrier between this hazard, now you have to know how to actually work around it. And so there should be standard procedures on how to operate around the, the hazard. And then it's the PPE. Then you put on the gloves, then you put on the glasses, then you put, you know, from there, the PPE is effective. With just putting on PPE and then walking into, you know, a room full of chemicals and, you know, and then figuring out what you're doing from there is not the way to go. It's a lot of planning um, that goes into controlling the hazard before you put on that protective equipment. Thanks, Alex. Uh, another question, along with ergonomics, can you uh, also touch on ADA accommodations? This can go along uh, with those who are allergic or sensitive to cannabis. Has anyone dealt with that issue in terms of ADA accommodations and sensitivity to cannabis? I, I mean, ADA, so the Ameri you know, American with Disabilities Act is absolutely you know, um, enforced um, in the industry. So, you know, making sure that, you know, walkways are wide enough doors or, you know, um, have the right accommodations. Um, but I am not aware of any ADA accommodations when it comes to sensitivity of the, of the plant. Uh, and does anybody else? No, no. And I mean, luckily a lot of the ADA, uh, requirements are covered during that, uh, plan review phase of, you know, getting a new facility or, you know, making updates or whatever to it, like the, um, the city or county department makes sure that that facility, you know, falls within ADA requirements. But yeah, I'm not quite sure if allergens, you know, fall under the ADA just yet. Uh, do you know of any companies that are creating equipment related to cannabis that meet machine guarding requirements, trimmers, uh, buckers, auto cures, et cetera. I, I do know a lot of the trim machines and I can't, I don't have the brands off the top of my head. They are, they do, they do, they are aware of the guarding requirements and for the most part, you know, they are there, but that is something that you have to take on an individual um, instrument or equipment. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't have a <laughs> better, more specific answer then, but, but that, the ones that I have seen are properly guarded. Uh, so something that I've seen with the machine guarding is uh, there needs to be some education that goes along with, you know, getting the, the equipment that has that machine guarding because there have been instances where those safety guards have been removed or altered because the employees or, you know, management, they don't understand why it's there. And sometimes it is easier to, you know, work with a piece of equipment without that guard on. But, you know, educating our staff and, you know, everyone in the company that the guard is there for a reason. Yeah, I see that the most in the, you know, industrial grinders a lot. People will clean them and then maybe not replace a guard or, you know, different types of trimmers, machines like that. Now with the new larger machines that will weigh out and separate bud into smaller containers. I mean, they're machines that are, you know, eight feet high and somebody's standing above it just dumping flour in the top. Um, you know, there are guards for those that they just, sometimes they're on and sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. Better administrative controls there, I agree. Yeah, great work practices that go along with those guards, I agree. Exactly. At what point do you recommend non-slip grip shoes be mandated in cultivation facilities? The starting so point. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean by that, the starting point? Anyone working in a cultivation facility should have non-slip shoes? Uh, in my opinion, yes. Um, mostly because there's always going to be, you know, water on the floor. Um, potentially other slip trips, falls, you know, issues in the cultivation. So one way to eliminate the possibility of, sl of slipping is just to get, you know, workplace shoes that, that are slip resistant. Yeah. I agree with Kelsey. 
Yeah, I think yeah, honestly, I, and I recommend this uh, to cultivations. I think cl uh, chef clogs um, that are water resistant, so you can wash them off. Because there's also you have to take in consideration that the pesticides are everywhere, pesticide residuals everywhere. What I also recommend is to leave those shoes at the facility. You have shoes you bring to the cultivation. You take them off when you get there. You put on these chef clogs, not or slip resistant footwear and then you you use that inside the facility because that's one of those big you know pesticide exposures are is a big deal and you don't want to bring them home to your family getting your time here a couple more questions this one's pretty granular many states require that cannabis license uh, see who creates waste to render their own waste unrecognizable and unusable on site uh, without their employees receiving any proper training on waste disposal. Is there a uh, potential OSHA violation in legally requiring employees to render e-waste, to render uh, waste with improper tools and with no training? Normally, this would be done by experts at a waste disposal facility. Yeah, I know this one very specific. This is actually one of the bigger hazards, and I, I mentioned it just briefly, is these chippers, right? So these... Um, Typically what people are using are wood chippers. And I'm be frank with you, they're not the best. One, again, they use, a lot of times they use gas. So they're emitting carbon monoxide. So you can't use them inside. So during the winter you, uh, you know, season, what are you doing? Are you chipping out in the snow? Um, and then these things get gunked up really bad. So if you don't chip every day with your waste, you know, and, you know, and your leaf waste turns mushy, now you're gunking this thing up. Now, the, and now people are putting their hands in these chippers. I mean, these, and I mean, you have obviously those serious hazards, you have the noise hazards. I mean, these, these are, are, are significant hazards. Um, uh, so, so yes, having the right chipper in place. Um, there are some that are, are, are designed for the industry. Um, I would say go, don't just pick up the first wood chipper you find, really do your homework there. Um, yeah, understand how to use it have very clear administrative controls and, and, and practices into place, uh, eye protection, you know, at minimum, um, because yeah, these are, these are one of the bigger hazards and definitely some OSHA violations there. And for one last question, this is gonna be a rapid fire round. I'm gonna start with you, Casey. As an EHS professional in, in a cannabis company, I struggle to prioritize um, all of these issues. Do you have any recommendation on what we should prioritize? Let's limit this to health and safety. Um, my, I would say that the priority for me is that the hazardous materials on site and proper storage and handling of those. It's just something I just, for me, with the explosions you see in the media all the time, you know, I just, I really think that I would prioritize that. Um, obviously everything is equal priority because it's about safety, right? Like it's, I understand the struggle. It's very hard. Um, I would definitely do a deep analysis on, you know, what facility you're in, how big are the hazards, what can we tackle? Um, and again, who needs the training and making sure that training is prioritized as well, of course. Kelsey, what do you prioritize? Uh, that's, that's difficult. Training, like we... <laughs> We need to do a better job of letting our staff know what are the hazards here and let's talk about it. I mean, that's, that's an obligation uh, that employers have. Like we, we need to relay that information. That's a hard now, question. Yeah. <laughs> no, both, both, great, yeah. both great answers and should be at the top of uh, the list there. You know, I'm going to say ergonomic issues. Um, I think uh, every business needs an ergonomic process and program. Um, the, 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 the claims that are coming in from worker comp right now are showing that, you know, strains, um, in the arms, um, and the, the different musculoskeletal disorders are, are on the rise. And because of the unique processes, I mean, it, pruning and, uh, you know, a plant isn't unique to the cannabis industry, but trimming, the, the final product is. And these trimmers that are working, you know, 40 hours a week, sitting in one position doing this repetitive motion, I just think that is one of the big 
issues that is ha another one of those looming issues over the industry. And I think it's going to come to light of a house of how serious those it is. And anybody that's worked in the industry as a trimmer knows that, you know, you come home after a long day and, and you're hurting. And, um, you know, so there we, we as an industry really need to focus on um, ergonomic processes and controls better. Well, we are at time. I want to thank uh, Casey, Kelsey, and Alex for participating in this important discussion on OSHA. Um, our contact information is all up on the screen there should you have any additional questions or needs. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to us talk about this and um, look forward to our next webinar on environmental health and safety issues. Thanks so much.